Hello everyone, my name is Allison Quinn and welcome to Seacrest Wardle's latest webinar, Innocent Third Party Rule is Abolished, Titan Insurance Company v. Heighton Applies to PIP Claims. Today I'm going to be brief and simply explain to you the impact of the Court of Appeals' decision last week in the Ali Bazi case, a case a lot of us have been anxiously awaiting an opinion on since oral argument was held in early December. The case is the first published case to address the innocent third party rule and whether this rule was abolished by the Michigan Supreme Court in 2012 in the Titan Insurance Company versus Heighton opinion. In fact, the Bozzi opinion was issued almost exactly four years to the day that Titan was released. So for just about four years, this area of law has been hotly contested and in flux. So where did the innocent third party rule come from? In 1976, just about three years after the No Fault Act was enacted, the Court of Appeals decided State Farm Mutual Automobile Insurance Company versus Kurlowitz. Don't hold me to that pronunciation. In this case, State Farm's insured had misrepresented on his application for insurance that he never had a suspended license. About 10 days after the policy went into effect, Kurlowitz was in an accident wherein one person was killed and five others injured. A few months later, State Farm rescinded the policy and voided it ab initio, in other words, as if the policy never existed. The estate of the decedent had filed a lawsuit against Kurlowitz, and State Farm then filed a declaratory action asking a court to determine the rights of the parties. The trial court found coverage, and State Farm therefore appealed. On appeal, State Farm relied on a 1959 case, Keys v. Pace, that held that an insurer could avoid liability where there was fraud in the procurement of the policy and the misrepresentations were unknown to the insurer at the time it issued the policy. In Kurlowitz, the Court of Appeals acknowledged that Keys had never been overruled, but ignored the case and instead looked to statutes enacted since the Keys opinion. These statutes included the No Fault Act, and the court found that it was policy in Michigan that victims of car accidents have a source and means for recovery. The Court of Appeals also looked to decisions out of other states, including California, New Jersey, and Utah. The court, again relying on public policy only, noted that State Farm could have obtained Kurlowitz's driving record for $2 and created what had become known as the easily ascertainable rule an innocent third party rule. These rules were Michigan law for nearly 36 years until the Michigan Supreme Court issued Titan Insurance Company versus Heighton. In this case, Titan filed a deck action and the Michigan Supreme Court was ultimately able to determine whether an insurer may avail itself of traditional legal and equitable remedies in order to avoid liability under an insurance policy on the ground of fraud in the application for insurance, whether the fraud was easily ascertainable and the claimant was a third party. The insured in that case had represented in her insurance application that her household had no drivers with suspended licenses when in fact, Heighton's license was suspended and remained suspended for a month after the inception of the policy. As you can guess what comes next, she was in an accident and Titan therefore sought to reform the policy to the statutory minimum limits of 20,000, 40,000. The Michigan Supreme Court held, held that common law defenses such as rescission based on fraud could be invoked by insurers and were only limited by statute. The court expressly overruled the Kurlowitz opinion and held that the Kurlowitz court was wrong in ignoring the keys precedent and relying on public policy that was not provided for in the language of the actual statutes. In other words, the easily ascertainable rule was a judicially created rule that had absolutely no basis in the law. Unless a statute precluded an insurer from rescinding a policy, it could do so. In Titan, it was determined that a statute prevented Titan from avoiding liability altogether but could reform the policy down to the 20,000 per accident, 40,000 per occurrence, rather 20,000 per person, 40,000 per occurrence, minimum required in Michigan. Although it was clear that Titan overruled Kurlowitz, 
the opinion did not clearly reference the innocent third party rule. These, the easily ascertainable rule, for example, had its own heading in the opinion. The opinion also did not reference how its decision would affect PIP claims, so the battle continued. This brings us now to the infamous Bazi case. This involved a 2012 accident where Ali Bazi was driving a car insured under a commercial policy in the name of a company called Mimo Investments. Seacrest Wardle had the privilege of handling this case, including investigating the coverage issue pre-suit. I actually argued the motions before the trial court, so I'm very familiar with the fraud issues in this case. Through EUOs of two women, Hala and Miriam Bazi, who took out the policy and were Ali Bazi's family members, it was discovered that Mimo Investments never had any assets, liabilities, employees, bank accounts, insurable interests, and so on. The vehicle records also showed that Hala leased the vehicle in her name and Mimo Investments therefore did not own the car. Even more, Ali Bazi, who was in his late teens, had a terrible driving record and was in a prior motor vehicle accident. At the time of the prior accident, they had insurance through a different insurer and it was under a different company name. At no time was Ali Bazi disclosed as a driver of the so-called Mimo Investments and Sentinel was not aware that he would be driving this vehicle. Sentinel then had us file a third party complaint against Hala and Miriam and eventually the policy was rescinded by virtue of a default judgment. After the rescission was in place, a motion was filed arguing that Sentinel was not liable for PIP benefits to Ali Bazi, the claimed innocent third party, based on the Titan versus Heighten decision. As we lawyers often do, we highlighted and emphasized for the court everywhere in the Titan decision where third parties were referenced in an attempt to show that the innocent third par party rule was in fact abolished and rescission is only limited by statute something that the No Fault Act did not have. After a very long oral argument before Judge Popke in Wayne County Circuit Court, the court declined to extend Titan versus Heighten to PIP benefit. Although in our minds, the Titan decision seemed clear, the innocent third party rule in its application to PIP benefits was uncertain and the decisions were all over the place. While the Bozzi case was going through the appellate process, the Court of Appeals it issued multiple unpublished opinions, some like Frost versus Progressive holding that the innocent third party rule was abolished and, app and applied to PIP, and others like State Farm versus QBE holding the exact opposite. Eventually, the Michigan Supreme Court held most of these cases in abeyance pending the decision in Bozzi. Given that the Michigan Supreme Court directed the Court of Appeals to hear the Bozzi case, and then held many unpublished cases in abeyance, it was almost a certainty that Bazi would provide the clarity needed and be the first published decision on this issue. Not surprisingly, on appeal, the major issues addressed in the Bazi briefs were what Titan Insurance Company versus Heighton really stood for. In other words, did it really abolish the innocent third party rule? And if so, does that apply to PIP claims? On the one side, you have Sentinel arguing that nothing in the No Fault Act precluded it from rescinding the policy and innocent third parties could still get benefits through the Michigan Assigned Claims Plan. On the other side was Bozzi in the Michigan Assigned Claims Plan arguing that Titan had not abolished the innocent third party rule and had not applied since it was a third party case that did not address PIP benefits. Just last week, more than six months after oral argument, the Court of Appeals issued its published opinion. The court acknowledged that the Michigan Supreme Court in Titan clearly overruled Kurlowitz. It also held that the easily ascertainable rule and the innocent third party rule were one and the same. To support this argument, the court noted that the Kurlowitz rule only applied if the fraud was easily ascertainable and involved an innocent third party. Nevertheless, even if they weren't the same rule, they both were rooted in the Kurlowitz decision. Therefore, the so-called innocent third party rule was abolished in Titan when it overruled Kurlowitz. The court in Bozzi went on to analyze Titan and acknowledge its conclusion that fraud is a defense 
except where limited by statute. The court discussed at length whether MCL 257.520 section F would apply in its role in the Titan decision. The panel in Bozzi ultimately turned to the question of whether there was any statute out there like 257.520 that would preclude an insurer from rescinding a policy as to PIP benefits. There was absolutely nothing in the No Fault Act that restricted the defense of rescission based on fraud as to PIP. The court rejected public policy arguments, just as the Titan Court did in overruling Kurlowitz, and held that if, if an insurer can establish that a policy was obtained through fraud, it can rescind a policy and deny payment of PIP benefits, including those to innocent third parties. So what now? Well, there will likely be an appeal to the Michigan Supreme Court. The makeup of the court is very different from what it was in 2012 when Titan was decided, so it's hard to predict what will happen. In the meantime, however, Bazi is a binding and published decision. A key issue addressed in Bazi is that the rescission must be valid. This will be an avenue for plaintiff's attorneys to attack a denial of benefits. Working with your underwriting department in this area is key. When you discover facts or misrepresentations made when the policy was obtained, it is important to know whether your company would have issued the policy had it known the truth. For example, in a separate case that I handled, the company issued a commercial policy and it was represented that the vehicle would be used only for business purposes. As it turned out, the vehicle was only used for business purposes about 25% of the time and was primarily being used as a personal vehicle. We thought maybe an argument for, could be made for a rescission, but in talking with the underwriting department, it turned out that that fact made no difference whatsoever, and according to the guidelines for coverage, the company would have issued the policy anyway. Knowing your underwriting guidelines is important. It also allows you to see if the misrepresentation was material to the risk. For example, in the Ali Bazi case, the failure to disclose Ali Bazi a young kid with a bad driving record and a history of accidents was material to the risk taken on by Sentinel. Examinations under oath and recorded statements can also be valuable tools in supporting a rescission defense. It obviously documents the representations or misrepresentations made to the insurer. When investigating a possible fraud in the procurement of a policy, we also recommend doing so right away. If you suspect any kind of fraud, an investigation should be started immediately. Also, as a side note, oftentimes rescission and cancellation are confused. What we are talking about and what the Bazi case addresses is rescission. This means returning all the premiums paid and voiding the contract back to its, to its inception, as if the contract was never made and the policy never issued. Cancellation, on the other hand, concerns a valid policy that's terminated for another reason, such as non-payment of the premiums. There are completely separate rules governing cancellation. Part of the reason why we recommend investigating immediately when suspecting fraud is that a claimant has one year to make a claim with the Michigan Assigned Claims Plan. If the assigned claims can be put on notice within a year of the accident, it may be easier to defend the case later on. An issue that's likely to come up after BASI is whether an insurer can rescind if the assigned claims can deny a claim outright for lack of notice. While we would, of course, argue that Bozzi nevertheless controls, I'm sure that plaintiff's attorneys will make some creative arguments so that their so-called innocent third-party clients are not left without anyone to pay their PIP claim. The Bozzi case also made it quite clear that it is up to the Michigan legislature and not courts to make an innocent third-party rule. Many of you know that proposed changes to the No Fault Act are brought before the legislature from time to time, but oftentimes they aren't passed and just sort of stall out. We will keep a lookout for any proposed changes that would restrict an insurer's ability to rescind as to PIP. As a last note, a reminder that with uninsured and underinsured motorist benefits, these coverages are op optional, so a valid rescission is a defense no matter what may happen in BASI at the Supreme Court level. Also, for those of you handling BI claims, at this time, 
although I have heard some possible challenges may be brought in the future. Titan Insurance Company versus Heighton made clear that statute precludes insurers from rescinding and avoiding liability altogether. Instead, in cases of fraud in the procurement of the policy, an insurer can merely reform the policy down to the minimum $20,000 per person, $40,000 per occurrence requirement. Thank you all for your time. I hope this clarifies some questions you had as to future claim handling and what the innocent third party rule was all about and the effect of the Bozzi decision. If you do have questions on anything, please feel free to call or email me and I'd be happy to help. Thank you again for attending this webinar.